Okay, welcome back everyone to our second lecture on BC 308, our course on Revelation and Daniel. We are now in Revelation 19. We're going to read verses 11 to 21, please. Could somebody read for us Revelation 19, 11 to 21. This is just after the great marriage supper of the Lamb. The next thing is the Lord himself comes with his saints. Let's read that. Somebody could read for us. Revelation 19, 11 to the end of the chapter. Now I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations. And he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself spreads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he has on his robe and on his, on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the birds that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather together for the supper of the great God, that you may eat eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses, and of those who sit on them, and the flesh of all people, free and slave, both small and great. And I saw the beasts, the kings of the earth, and their armies gathered together to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. Then the beast was captured, and with him the false prophet, who worked signs in his presence, by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast, and those who worshipped his image. These two were cast live into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. And the rest were killed with the sword, which proceeded from the mouth of him who sat on the horse, and all the birds were filled with their flesh. Mm. So this is the battle of Armageddon. So we saw in Revelation 16, the end, um, uh, verses 12 um, to 14, that the armies of the earth, the kings of the earth, they were all being mobilized to come towards Israel. The river Euphrates had dried up. They are coming in. And at this time, we saw that Babylon has fallen. In heaven, there's a marriage supper of the Lamb. All that's over, and then Jesus comes. He's riding on a white horse, and uh, clothed in white. His name is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And all the saints are with him. Out of his mouth is going a double-edged sword, meaning his words, the words he speaks. And uh, it says, with his word, he destroys all of these, these these kings who have come against the uh, uh, Israel. So there are these ten horns, ten primary leaders. The beast and the false prophet, that's the Antichrist and the false prophet, they are taken and thrown into the lake of fire. Gone, taken out of the way. And just by the word of his mouth, the armies, the lead kings, all destroyed. Now, again, this is something we just have to imagine how this is going to be. If armies are going to move against Israel, and this is not like one other nation, it's armies of the earth. You know, they can, if they all get together, and how many, I don't know how many, you know, how many. Thousands of people, would soldiers and others, would be deployed against a tiny little country. They are moving in, and just with the word of his mouth, he's just destroying. And what we read 
uh, earlier that um, the blood will flow as uh, this is in Revelation 14 that blood will flow as high as a horse's bridle for uh, uh, I think about 20, 230 miles or something outside of the city so much of bloodshed there's going to be so much of bloodshed outside and by the word of his mouth he will destroy it them so it's going to it's it's hard to imagine how how devastating this is going to be but god is going to intervene and um, you know if, if, if you'd like to you could also read zechariah the 14th chapter where zechariah describes this that the lord himself will descend on Mount Olives. So remember when in Acts 1, when Jesus ascended, the angel said, the same Jesus will come as you have seen him go. Zechariah says, he will come, the Lord will come, he will set foot on Mount, Mount the Mount of Olives. He will set foot. So the Lord's going to come, intervene. And from that time on, he's going to set up his kingdom. Also remember in Daniel chapter 12, we saw that there was a gap of about uh, 45 days. Uh, and it's, we just presumed, we can't prove it, but we just made the assumption that Maybe this 45 days is that day of cleansing, days of cleansing, just cleaning up the whole city of Jerusalem, the temple, and everything. You know, just while uh, his, the Lord establishes his kingdom here on earth before the temple is cleansed and the sacrifices are restored, and so on. So, Revelation chapter 20, then. In one chapter, just in one chapter, we are informed or we are told that the Lord is going to reign on the earth for 1,000 years. And during this 1,000 years, Satan is going to be out of the way. He's going to be bound. He's going to put in a bottomless pit. And then we read a little bit about this millennial reign, what life will be like on the earth during the millennial reign. Isaiah prophesied a little bit. Um, he mentions this in a little bit in Isaiah 11, Isaiah 65. He says about the very nature of things will be changed. Men will beat their swords into plowshares. The child will play with the lion, will put, it, put its hand in the viper's nest. Uh, the lion and the lamb will lie down together. So there's going to be some, there's going to be a drastic change in the nature of things during that thousand year reign. So we don't have all the information, but we can you know, make some deductions based on certain passages on what this thousand year reign will look like. And I, I will mention it. Uh, we will read uh, Revelation 20. But Revelation 20 is telling us about this thousand year reign and what will happen after that. After the thousand year reign, Satan will be loosed for a brief period of time. Again, we don't know how long that is, how many days it's going to be. But he'll be released for a brief moment, period of time to do his final work. Why God decides to do that, I don't know. It just says here, Revelation 20, that's what's going to happen. And what is interesting is that even in that last time that God gives to Satan to be on the earth. He will succeed in deceiving people. And this is very hard to imagine because Jesus is reigning in Jerusalem. The saints are administering his kingdom. Satan is released. Satan is out of the way for a thousand years. He's released for a little bit of time. And he succeeds in deceiving some people at that time. 
and he, he makes his one final attempt to go against Jerusalem, against God, the Lord and the people in Jerusalem, but he's destroyed. And uh, destroyed means he's stopped to this fire fallen, falling from heaven, and he's prevented from going against Jerusalem. And he's then cast into the lake of fire forever. There's a great white throne judgment at that time. So all this is in chapter 20. So chapter 20 is, 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 is really describing things that's going to take place over 1,000 years. It's contained in one chapter. Let's read, please. Revelation chapter 20. Somebody could read for us verses 1 through 6. Revelation 20, 1 through 6, please. Then I saw an angel coming down from, the, from heaven, having the key to the bottom left. The spit and a great chain in his hand. He laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of the old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And he cast him in a... Collins, I think maybe we are not able to hear you. Okay. So that he should um, deceive the nation no more until the 1000 years are finished. And I was. committed to them. Um, I yes, uh, Collins, I think uh, um, you... Then I saw an angel coming from heaven, having he laid hold of the spit, so that he should do these things. Okay. All right, let me just finish that. I think Colin is having some trouble here. Verse 4, I'm reading from verse 4. I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image, and had not received uh, his mark on their foreheads or on their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. But the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Over such, the second death has no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. Could then somebody read for us, starting from verse 7 till verse 15, please? Revelation 20, verses 7 to 15, please. Revelation chapter 20, verses 7 to 15. Now when the thousand years are expired, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, whose number is as the sand of the sea. They went upon the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are. And they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Then I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. And there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God. And books were opened, and another book was opened. 
which is the book of life, and the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. The seas, the sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them, and they were judged each one according to their work. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death, and anyone not found in the not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Mm. So, summary of chapter twenty: What happens after the battle of Armageddon? Satan is bound for a thousand years, taken out of the way, and um, those who were martyred during the tribulation, who died for the Lord Jesus, they are raised up. So they're going to live. They're going to live along with all the saints who have come with the Lord. All have resurrected bodies, glorified bodies. So the saints are entering the millennium, the thousand year reign, with glorified bodies. Now, there will be people from the millennium sorry, from the seven years of tribulation, who are entering into the millennium, who are natural human beings. They, uh, they do not, they did not receive the mark of the beast, but they survived. Um, they will move in to the millennium. So we have the Lord Jesus, reigning from Jerusalem. Satan has been bound, taken out of the way. The beast and the false prophet put in the lake of fire. All uh, the people have been, those who came against Jerusalem, against the Lord, they've, they've been killed, destroyed in the battle of Armageddon. All that's cleaned out. Now in the millennium, we have saints with resurrected bodies, glorified bodies on the earth. We also have natural people who have come from the tribulation continuing on into the millennium. And they are going to procreate, going to multiply, fill the earth. So Isaiah 65 describes this, saying that uh, a child will be born and live a hundred years. That we will plant vineyards, we will build houses, we will enjoy the work of our hands. Uh, the very nature of things, as I said, will be changed, and we will be here for 1,000 years. We also learned from Luke 19 that uh, during the millennium, uh, saints will be given authority over cities to help administer the kingdom. So we see this in Luke 19. We learn about this from 1 Corinthians 6, where Paul writes, he says, don't you know that saints will even judge angels? Daniel chapter 7, the kingdom is given to the saints of the Most High, and they will reign on the earth. So we are going to reign. And here it says, they lived and reigned. Revelation 20, they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. Revelation 20 and verse 4. And then again in verse 6, they will be priests of God and shall reign with him a thousand years. So we are going to reign with Jesus. The, the, the natural people will be procreating. They will multiply on the earth. And so we need to teach them. Let us go up and worship the Lord who is in Jerusalem. So natural people are on the earth. They will need to be te teaching them, discipling them, continuing to point them to Jesus. Just that Satan and his demons won't be operating on the earth at that time. And like we mentioned, Satan is going to be released for a brief moment, and he even succeeds in deceiving the nations. So we're seeing that in verse 7 and 8. And he gathers the people whom he succeeds in deceiving. And uh, Gog and Magog are mentioned there. Now we hear a uh, read about Gog and Magog in Ezekiel the 38th chapter as part of the tribes who will come against Israel. Now it is generally thought that Gog and Magog refers to certain tribes that are part of uh, Russia. Uh, and, and it's, it's, it's definitely referring to people who have been deceived by the devil at that time. And they're, they're being mobilized to go against, go into battle 
large numbers. It says as numbers as the sand of the sea. And they want they surround the camp of the saints, the beloved city. The beloved city is the city of Jerusalem. But God intervenes. Fire comes down from heaven. And the devil is removed once and for all, sent into the lake of fire. Why does God do this? Why does God release the devil on the earth for that period of time? Uh, we don't know what the duration is. Um, uh, and why does God do it? Uh, uh, we don't know. There's no you know, answer given to us in the Bible. So we can only think uh, possible reasons. One could be is that because these people have lived in the in the in the in the millennium, they've never been tempted as such by the devil. Maybe those who are there at that time would be tempted by the devil. That could be a reason. Another reason could be God letting Satan know for one final time that he is the defender of his own people and he defends the saints so that could be another reason i mean we just we're just thinking you know we, just, we can't prove it from scripture other than oh, deductions we make based on what we read that maybe these are the reasons why god allows the devil even after binding him for a thousand years to come back on the earth for that brief period of time to deceive the nations so after after that after satan is taken out of the way then comes this great and final moment which is called the great white throne judgment revelation 20 verses 11 to 15 the bible, the bible says at that point every human person who ever lived is brought back to life Wherever they died, in the mountains, the hills, the valleys, the seas, they're all brought back to life and they stand before the throne of God. Now, we know that the saints will be having glorified bodies. We know there will be people who believe in Jesus during the millennium. They'll be standing there. On the other side will be people who have rejected Jesus. Basically it says their name was not found written in the book of life. They'll be there. So there'll be the separation of the sheep and the goats as Jesus described it in Matthew 25. And, uh, and that will be the last and final judgment. So there will be one set of people who rejected Jesus. The Bible says the names are not found in the book of life. They will be cast into the lake of fire. And there will be another set of people on the right hand who have believed, who have received, and they will receive, all of them will, have their glor will receive their glorified bodies and they will be evacuated out of the earth at that time. So why do you, why why should be be evacuated out of the earth? Why should be taken away? Because the next thing that's going to happen after the great white throne judgment is that God is going to create new heavens and a new earth. So when the Bible says new heavens, it means this universe as we know it, and this earth, new heavens and the new earth. And Peter describes this in 2 Peter 3. He says that the earth will be destroyed by fire. So remember, God had promised he will never destroy the earth by a flood. So just create this thing. Peter describes, 2 Peter 3, that the elements will melt with fervent heat. All oh, this whole universe, it's, it's almost like this whole universe is going to just come together. And scientifically, uh, it, it can happen if this whole it just this whole universe collapses it will melt with fervent heat everything gone and there's going to be new heavens new earth new heavens meaning this universe that we know of it today will be gone all the planets all the stars everything gone New heavens at a new planet Earth, completely new. Only God can do that. 
So, you know, our minds can't fathom how it's going to happen. How can this big universe just be gone, be destroyed, be taken out, and something new come in its place? But that's what God's going to do. So Revelation chapters 21 and 22 describe life in the new heaven and the new earth. These are the only two chapters that describe that new heavens and new earth. Second Peter 3 tells us that, you know, Peter says he will destroy everything and bring in a new heaven and new earth. What will new heaven and new earth look like? Revelation 21 and 22. So things will be quite different here. Of course, there'll be no more weeping, no more sorrow, no more death. The sin and whatever we know on earth today it will not be there in the new earth. Heaven will be physically translated to the earth. Right? Heaven. So John sees heaven descending. Heaven physically put on the earth. The great city that God has built will be transferred here. And uh, it describes what life will be like. I see Devi has a question. Okay, Devi, uh, please go ahead, ask your question. Thank you, Pastor. Um, I was uh, having this um, question about the people who would uh, be the natural people, as you mentioned, who would uh, be transferred to the millennial reign. Uh, so you said that uh, those are the people who have not received the mark of the beast. So does that mean uh, that they believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and they survived the tribulation? Uh, is, mm -hmm. is that what yeah. it's meant? Yeah, so we'll have both kinds. We will have people who have refused the mark of the beast and uh, believed in Jesus and they've survived and they come over into the millennium there will also be people who just didn't know anything like they went you know maybe in some remote part some will remote village and i don't know some remote parts of the the world uh they survived they didn't necessarily receive the mark of the beast but I don't know if we can say they are believers, but they come across, they come over into the millennium. The reason is we see that in during the millennium, we are going to be involved in discipling the nations and telling telling people to go and worship the Lord who is in Jerusalem. People will say, "Can you tell me? Can you you know? I, I want to go up to the house of God, uh, who is in Israel." The nations will flow to it to the uh, Jerusalem. So there will be people who need to be taught uh, during the millennium. And uh, so that's what we are saying. Uh, so this we can read in Isaiah chapter 2. Uh, Isaiah chapter 2, where it gives us you know, something. The first few verses it talks about the life in the millennium. Isaiah 2. Yeah. Sure, Pastor. So, uh, those people who receive the mark of the beast uh, during the tribulation time, what what is actually happening to them? Yeah. So, there will be um, those who have. Um, let's see here. Does it say? Um, so, verse twenty-one of Revelation nineteen says, Revelation 19, and the rest were killed with the sword which proceeded from the mouth of him who sat on the horse, and all the birds were filled with their flesh. Right? So, Revelation 19, uh, the last few verses, is telling us that those who received the mark of the beast, those who worshipped his image, they would all be killed with the sword that proceeded from the mouth of him who sat on the throne. So I am concluding here and um, um, that all those who receive the mark of the beast, all those who worship the image of the beast, will be taken out of the way 
and will not be allowed to enter into the millennium. There will be those who professed faith, and then, of course, there will be those who didn't know what, you know, were left out in some way, who will move into the millennium. But those who did receive the mark of the beast and worship the image of the beast will be killed. That's what we see here at the end of Revelation 19. Sure, sure, Master. Thank you. Yeah. Um, uh, another passage to read is Zechariah 14. You know, it says that uh, uh, nations will be brought to worship the Lord who is ruling and reigning from Jerusalem. You know, so they're being taught to worship Jesus. So as the people are multiplying on the earth, uh, they will be brought to worship Jesus. Okay. So let's read Revelation 21 and 22, which describes life uh, or describes the new heavens and the new earth. Um, uh, and uh, uh, be, again, it's just amazing. You know, John is just having a vision of what it's going to look like, and he records it for us. So let's read this two chapters, please. And let's start Revelation 21. Verses 1 to 8, somebody could read that for us. New heavens and a new earth. Revelation chapter 21, verse 1 to 8. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also, there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give of the fountain of the water of life freely to him who thirsts. He who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Mm. So, thank you. We're beginning to see what this new heavens and the new earth will look like. So John is seeing the holy city, Jerusalem, being transferred to the earth from heaven. It's coming onto this new earth. So this city that's in heaven is being brought down to the earth. Now, of course, you know, we don't know what material that city is made of today. Uh, we know what you know, earth and things that are materials that we have. We don't know what material is going to be there in the new heavens and the new earth. But this is something very tangible, very real uh, that John sees. That God Himself, His dwelling place, is transferred to this new earth, and uh, there is no crying, no none of the things, the things we know, no sin. None of that is in that new place. He says, I make all things new. No death, no sorrow, no pain, no, and none of the immoral things. None of that is in that holy city. And let's read on. Uh, verse 9 to verse 21, please. Somebody could read that.
Revelation chapter 21 verses 9 to 21. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls filled the seven last plagues came to me and talked with me saying, Come, I'll show you the bride, the lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. Her light was like a most precious stone, like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. Also, she had a great and high wall with 12 gates and 12 angels at the gates. And names written on them, which are the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. Three gates on the east, three gates on the north, three gates on the south, and three gates on the west. Now the wall of the city had twelve foundations, and on them were the names of twelve apostles of the Lamb. And he who talked with them, with me, had a gold reed to measure the city, its gates, and its wall. The city is laid out as a square. Its length is as great as its breadth. And he measured the city with a reed, 12,000 furlongs. Its length, breadth, and height are equal. Then he measured its wall, 144 cubits, according to the measure of a man, that is, of an angel. The construction of its wall was jasper, and the city was pure gold, like clear glass. The foundations of the wall of the city were adorned with all kinds of precious stones. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third chalcedony, the fourth emerald, the fifth sardonyx, the sixth sardius, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth chrysoprase, the eleventh jacinth, and the twelfth amethyst. The twelve gates were twelve pearls. Each individual gate was of one pearl. And the street of the city was pure gold, like transparent glass. Mm, thank you. Thank you, Jeffrey. I did well with all those names. <laughs> so hard. Anyway, so John is seeing this New Jerusalem. And I think this is, you know, the bride. This is like what the Lord has been preparing for his people, right? And this this amazing city. And John is describing what he is seeing with the kinds of things he knows. It's like the walls are gold, streets are gold, gates are big pearls, and the foundations are it has all these amazing precious stones, different colors, clear glass. So Basically, John is trying to capture this amazing, amazing thing that he's seeing with the best he knows, you know, with gold and these precious stones. It this made me, basically, the city is totally unimaginable. It's beyond what we can have imagined. And God has prepared this city for his people. And we are going to be dwelling in that amazing city. So, you know, it's it's even hard even to imagine what it's going to be like. Imagine walls of gold, streets of gold. It's it's hard to you know imagine. And then and then and, and it's it's we don't know like how big, how wide the city is, but you're just saying this is how the city is going to be. And in that city. The apostles of the Lamb are honored. The tribes of Israel are honored. And that's interesting. Because we think that, hey, you know, um, these 12 tribes were just something that God did at that point in time. But the remembrance of it is going to be in that new heavens, the new earth, the remembrance of the twin names of the 12 tribes. The apostles, the names are, are going to be remembered. So in one sense, in a good sense, there's going to be remembrance of what the Lamb of God has done for us, what God has done for us as his people. Right? So let's read on verses 22 to the end. So if you could read that. Yeah. 
Revelation 21, verse 22 on. Verse 22 on. But I saw no temple in it, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city had no need of the sun or of the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God illuminated it. The Lamb is its light, and the nations of those who are saved shall walk in its light. And the kings of the earth bring their glory and honor into it. Its gate shall not be shut at all by day. There shall be no night there. And they shall bring the glory and the honor of the nations into it. But there shall by no means enter it anything that defiles or causes an abomination or a lie, but only those who are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Amen. Mm. Amen. So, something more that we understand about the new heavens and the new earth, that there is no need for the sun and the moon and all of those things. So, Light, the glory of God itself is the illumination. It's going to be like, you know, when the time was before God said, let there be light. God himself was the light. Uh, before he created the, you know, these, the sun, the moon, uh, the sun and the stars, basically to give light and all of that. So, we don't know what the new heavens are going to look like, but what it does say is there's no need, there's no dependence on the sun uh, and the moon as we understand things today. And it's going to be a holy, holy place. Okay. Let me just read through the last chapter, Revelation 22, as we bring this to a close. I'll just read this through, Revelation 22. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the middle of its street and either side of the river was the tree of life, which bore twelve fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. They shall see his face, and his name shall be on their foreheads. There shall be no night there. They need no lamp, nor the light of the sun. For the Lord God gives them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. Then he said to me, the wo These words are faithful and true, and the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show his servants the things which must shortly take place. Behold, I am coming quickly. Blessed is he who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. Now I, John, saw and heard these things, and when I heard and saw, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel who showed me these things. Then he said to me, See that you do not do, it, do that, for I am your fellow servant, and of your brethren, the prophets, and of those who keep the words of this book, worship God. And he said to me, Do not seal the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand, he was unjust, let him be unjust still. He was filthy, let him be filthy still. He was righteous, let him be righteous still. He was holy, let him be holy still. And behold, I'm coming quickly, and my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Blessed are those who do his commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates into the city. But outside are dogs and sorcerers and sexually immoral, immoral and murderers and idolaters and those who love and practice lies. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright and morning star. And the spirit and the bright say, come. Let him who hears say, come. Let him who thirsts come. Whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. For I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, if anyone adds to these things, God will add to him the plagues that are written in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part from the book of life, from the holy city, and from the things which are written in this book. 
He who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming quickly. Amen. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. So chapter 22, as he looks into, is given a glimpse of the new heavens and the new earth. He sees the throne of God. He sees the Lamb of God. He sees the river of life flowing and the tree of life. Uh, very interesting. There are 12 different fruits from one tree. What those fruits are, we don't know. But he's saying that through this, people are kept in eternal health. It's for the healing of the nations. It doesn't mean people will fall sick and need to be healed. It just means that it's the health. They, there's just per, there's perpetual health for the people. He also points out that there's no need for light. God himself is the light in the city. And then he says, you know, these things are going to come to pass. And, uh, you know, hold on to the words of this prophecy. Keep the words. Don't let anybody quest cause you to question these words. It's going to happen. And then the Lord says, you know, I'm coming quickly. And hold on to these words. Uh, don't let anybody change anything. Don't let anyone take away from these words. Don't let anybody add to these words. I'm coming quickly. So, Book of Revelation is an amazing book because it's telling us of things that are going to take place. Amazing things. And God has given us just enough of what we need. And I'm sure that you know, about the new heavens and the new earth, there's just so much more unimaginable. You know, God in these two chapters has said, look, this is what's going to look like. And of course, there's going to be so much more than what is given, described in these two chapters. It's, it's going to be way beyond anything we have ever can imagine. And he's saying, hold on to these words. So in a day and age when you know, people are skeptical about so many things. We are challenged to believe what the Bible says about the end of the ages, the end of times given to us. We saw it in Daniel. We, we read a lot of it in Revelation. And we just hold on to these words and let no one take away, no one add to it. We just hold on to the words that the Lord has given to us and live by that. So with this, we will conclude our course. Um, I want to say thanks, thanks to all of you for journeying with us through Daniel and Revelation. Uh, all the videos are available online, so you could go back and listen to it if you have any questions. And um, so one last thing is left, which is the final assessment, which I will work on and put it up. I will send you an email as soon as it's up. And you can, uh, it, it'll be an open book, open notes, so you don't have to worry about it. Just complete that so you can get your grade. It'll be just about an one hour, maximum two hours of your time to do that assessment. Uh, but make sure you do it so that uh, a grade can be given. Right. So I hope you enjoyed journeying through Daniel and Revelation and helped you understand things. And we will definitely, you know, uh, continue doing this over and over again. So anytime you want to come back and attend the course, you're most welcome. Or just refresh yourself on Daniel and Revelation. You can always connect or just listen to the videos online. Okay. Can somebody close in prayer and then we'll dismiss, please. Somebody can pray. Thank you all for your notes there. I see you in chat. Yeah. Father in heaven. 
Okay, let's pray. Heavenly Father, I come to you under the name of Jesus. I thank you for this day. I thank you for uh, everything that we learned from the book of uh, Daniel and Revelation. We thank you for Pastor Ashes uh, for teaching us these valuable truths. And God, we thank you for your word, which stands still forever, Jesus. God, we thank you for your grace, your kindness upon us uh, that was with us even as we were learning. Uh, we thank you for good Wi-Fi connections that we had throughout the whole course. And God, we thank you for helping us to understand the deeper truths. And God, I pray that Jesus, every word that we learn, we will keep it in our heart. And God, we will shine much more brighter for your glory, Jesus so that, God, we can bring the lost souls into your kingdom. I thank you for all my classmates. We thank you for everything that you have said in our life. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much for joining on this course. I'll see you again. God bless you. Bye.